Good evening or good morning, depending on when exactly you're viewing this Bible study. Welcome back to our Bible study from the book of Mark as we look at the topic of tests from God. Uh, this week we're going to be flipping to Mark chapter 9 if you have your Bibles with you. And so let's open first with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that as we look at the Gospel of Mark, you would teach us about your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to face the trials and the tests of faith in this life, and help us to do so courageously and fueled by your Holy Spirit. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark chapter 9 uh, has sometimes been called the, the sort of pinnacle or the climax of the Gospel of Mark, rightly or wrongly. A lot of people say, you know, the, the book of Mark uh, is all about Jesus going and acting as the Son of God and, and, and declaring his office uh, and his work as Messiah. And this happens through dramatic miracles that Jesus executes uh, through his divine nature. It happens uh, through the bold deeds that he does. And so Mark 9 is really exciting because Mark 9 is when you get to the transfiguration. And so uh, we tend to always think of the, the crucifixion and the resurrection as the, uh, the sort of climax of, of the novel uh, of a gospel like the gospel of Mark, but some people would argue that the transfiguration is because at the transfiguration, we see that first line of Mark, uh, fulfilled. We see that it is the son of God. We see Jesus on the mountain and he's shining like the sun. Uh, and we see, we could talk about the transfiguration, I'm sure, and talk about how there's, there's sort of some test themes there as well in the transfiguration, uh, and, and the disciples kind of fail in their own way. Uh, but I'd like to move on to the next story after the Transfiguration, because it's one of my favorites, and I think it's an important one for us. So we remember at the Transfiguration, that's the moment where Jesus calls up his closest disciples. Sometimes New Testament scholars will call them the inner circle of disciples. Uh, so you have Peter, James, and John, and they go up to the mountain, and you have the rest of the disciples who are there. Now, to to kind of give us that, that before what's happening, uh, if we jump to what's after uh, this account, what's after this account is some debate about which of the disciples is the greatest. They're concerned about who is the greatest, and that's what they're worried about. So you can already see that there's some jealousy kind of brewing. There's some sense of, there's some fear, rather, of favoritism from the other disciples, uh, and we really get that in, in our account for today. So I want you to keep both of those notions uh, both of those uh, events in your mind as we look at the, the gospel lesson for today uh, for our Bible study. So we have the transfiguration before, we have them fighting about the great who is the greatest afterwards, and now what actually happens in the middle? Where is our, our test from God today? Well, let's turn to verse 14 of Mark chapter 9. So if we're at Mark 9, verse 14. And when, he, when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, What are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. All right, uh, so quite a scene here, right? We remember that Jesus is someone who is, uh, he's, he's kind of a, a, a John Wesley figure in some sense. He's preaching without a license, right? Uh, he, he doesn't really have a, a, a humanly orchestrated call, you would say. Like, he doesn't have the call documents uh, from the synagogue or from the temple or, or from those things. And so when Jesus teaches the word of God, people don't like it. And the people who really don't like it are the religious authorities because they're the ones uh, who would, you know, say, this is our job. This is not your job. You aren't qualified for this. You know, you're the son of a carpenter. You're not going to be able to t teach people uh, about the Torah, about the Tanakh, about the scriptures. And so Jesus was already faced with uh, the controversy of religious authorities. Religious authorities didn't like him. They were always opposing him, even if others liked him, and, and the people he helped certainly liked him. And so we get this argument. So Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration. It's this great moment where everyone's excited, right? Peter says, let's just stay here forever, you know? Let's just stay on the mountain forever. And who could blame him, right? Let's just stay here 
in heaven forever. Let's, I'm done with life. You know, let's just, let's bypass that. Uh, but of course, Jesus has more to do. And so uh, they go down the mountain. And when they go down the mountain, they get to the scene. And what's happening in the scene? Well, his disciples are arguing with the scribes, with the religious authorities, the people who had studied the Bible uh, and who knew everything. They'd, they'd read all the commentaries that Jesus' disciples probably knew nothing about. And so they're arguing with the disciples, and it's actually probably, they're probably winning the argument because Jesus' disciples have just failed. So the disciples that were left, the ones who probably were already feeling like inferior, uh, they, they kind of have an inferiority complex because they got left behind while the inner circle got to go up the mountain of transfiguration. Uh, and so while they're there, they try and do what Jesus does, right? They're trying to, to pass the test of being his disciples. They're trying to go and do what he does and say what he says. And what they're finding is that they're failing this test, right? You know, we're called uh, to follow in Jesus' footsteps. We're called to witness to our faith and to speak to others about God. Uh, and we will find ourselves very often in the position the disciples are in here. Uh, we'll find ourselves in the position where there'll be people who seem smarter than us, people who, who can argue better than us. You might find yourself in a position in life where someone asks you about your faith or they accuse you about your faith and you try and defend it. And you might be great at apologetics or, or not. Uh, and it might not matter because you might be arguing with someone who's a genius or someone who's just better at arguing than you are. And they're making you look like a fool uh, for your faith. And the, the disciples find themselves in that spot, right? They're arguing. Uh, you might just find yourself arguing with someone. There, there's some people who see religion just as the, the only purpose behind religion is to start fights about ideas. Uh, there's never anything deeper than that. It's just like, let's just have a fight about Bible verses. And that's, that's really all Jesus wants from us. Uh, and so there's some people who just like to fight about religion. And the scribes were those who like to fight about religion. Uh, and so they're there arguing with the disciples who are supposed to be helping someone who is in need. So it shows us the test of what is it like to follow in Jesus' footsteps to do what Jesus does? Well, it's really hard, and a lot of the times we're going to fail at it. We're not going to succeed at it like we, we should and like we want to. Um, but the disciples are trying, and you can give them that credit at least. So they are trying. The crowd uh, is, uh, you know, they're amazed, they're, they're shocked. There's controversy going on, uh, and someone from the crowd comes up. Uh, and they address Jesus. And it's interesting the way that he describes it. So first of all, uh, he said, verse 17, someone from the crowd answered him, teacher or rabbi, I brought my son to you. It's interesting. Uh, he, wants, he wants to go to Jesus and he has to go to his disciples. And when he goes to the disciples, the under shepherds, the people in place of Jesus, we have all this nice flowery language about the ministry and how the, the ministers are, you know, the, the ones called and sent in Christ's stead. And what happens so often when they're called and sent in Christ's stead, they suck. They're not good at what they're supposed to be good at. They fail in being who Jesus was to others. Uh, every pastor who's ever found themselves at the side of a hospital bed realizes that he is not Jesus, that he can't heal, that he can't make anyone better, that he can hold their hand as they die, but that he can't really do a lot more than pray for them. Uh, and so the disciples are stuck too. They don't have the, the almighty power of God. They are not the divine logos made flesh. They're just human beings. Uh, and they're trying their best, but it's not good enough. How many people have come because they want to see Jesus? They've come to a church or a uh, religious meeting, something like that. They want to see Jesus. And what do they see? They see humans and they're very disappointed. Uh, they're disappointed that God would entrust his, his service and his ministry uh, to humans, and yet God does. He did in the Old Testament, he does in the New Testament. Uh, he entrusts it to fallible sinners. Uh, and so often people are scandalized and they are hurt by the church and by what happens uh, by certain pastors, what they've said or what they've done or what they haven't done. Uh, I'm sure I've probably scandalized some people, whether I know it or not, uh, in my ministry already. But God still calls me to it. And like these disciples, you know, we have to, we have to do the best that we can. We're called to all sorts of things in life, all sorts of tests uh, God sets up for us. You know, we're called to be good parents or, or good workers or good children even. Uh, and often we find ourselves just lost. We find ourselves failing in those very tests. And so this man comes uh, and he wants to see Jesus and he's stuck with a, a ministry, he's stuck with a pastor. Uh, and the pastor can't do anything to help his demon-possessed son. And so he talks about his, his son, and his son has gone through something terrible. 
Uh, he's gone through uh, some kind of mix of demon possession and epilepsy, it looks like. Uh, the, the boy is having seizures. Uh, it's so that, you know, he almost drowns sometimes. Uh, sometimes he falls into the fire. Uh, and it's it's a terrible description of what's happening to this boy's son. Uh, and I mean, just to put myself in the position of a father, you know, you're a father, you love and you care for your son, and then this is happening, and you must be thinking, you know, what did I do wrong uh, that my son would suffer like this? Uh, what, what do I have to do to make it so that my son doesn't suffer anymore? And, you know, this man is probably uh, at his wit's end. He's probably prayed every prayer. He's probably gone to every traveling teacher he could find, uh, and here he is coming to Jesus, hoping that this might be the one, and his disciples are just as inept as, as the rest of us at, at trying to, to exercise this power, and they can't cast out this demon. And so he brings this complaint directly to Jesus. And what a wonderful thing that it is that despite the fallible ministers, despite the failed missionaries, despite the bad Christians we see in our world around us, on which we are sometimes in the world around us, how wonderful that we can still approach the Lord Jesus in prayer, uh, that we can still read the words of Jesus directly in the scriptures, uh, that despite how bad uh, any person standing in the, the office or the place of Christ uh, is we can still address the Lord directly. That's a great comfort to us, uh, that we're not just stuck with the people in between. So let's read Jesus' response, verse 19. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Now, one of the things I find so fascinating about the way that the Gospels are set up and the way that we read the stories in the Gospels is that some people, uh, how would I hear it? Someone the other day was saying during this pandemic, um, God will never give you anything more than you can handle. Uh, and the interesting thing I always see in the Bible is usually God gives people more than they can handle for a little while and then he steps in. <laughs> people are at their wits end and then they get pushed one more foot. And they just collapse. They are they are at the point of utter despair. And then God steps in, right? And so it's uh, the way God, even the way God is going to deliver us, right? It's not, uh, you know, people can talk about rapture or all these theories, but the reality is that we're going to die, folks. Uh, and when is God going to come and rescue us? Before we die? No, probably after we die. Right, And so we still have to go through death before we get to new life. And that's what happens here, right? So the man brings it to the disciples, hopes the disciples can heal his son. The disciples can't heal his son. And then Jesus is here. Yay, Jesus is here, finally. And what do we think is going to happen? We think as soon as Jesus is going to be there, the demon is going to book it. He's just going to get out. He's going to flee. Uh, everyone's going to eat cake, and it's going to be wonderful. And then what happens? Jesus is there. The boy falls down, starts convulsing, just like every other time. And this is the moment where uh, to be the father, to still have faith, you know, that is the test. And what this test from God is, I think, uh, I would call it the test of endurance. You know, this man has had to deal with this every day of his life. There are so many of us uh, who find ourselves in situations that we can't get away from uh, and that it's not like we're just going to go through a bad weekend and we're going to get over it. Uh, there are people who are struggling with diseases in our congregation that have been struggling with them for years. There's people who have issues and pains and aches that they've been dealing with for years. There's people who suffered uh, all sorts of hindrances and disabilities and they've dealt with those for years. And it doesn't get any easier necessarily. And so we are called to endure. We're called not to give up, but to endure. Those are really your only two options. I was listening to a secular philosopher and psychologist this week who was talking about, he said, well, really in life, you have two options. Either you can just collapse under the weight of it all, or you can have faith and you can go forward. I was quite surprised to hear him say that, but that is the situation we find ourselves in life. So that's where this man is, right? He can just give it all up and say, you know what? Fine. No one's ever going to make anything better. That's it. Or... He can continue in faith. He can have endurance. Uh, we're told in the, the scriptures that one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is patience, and the King James renders it better, uh, long-suffering. 
That's what patience means. Long suffering, to be able to suffer for a really long time. That's something that the Holy Spirit works within us. Uh, boy, I sure would rather have joy uh, than long suffering, but long suffering too is a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And so this is something that God works in his people and God is working it in the Father uh, as we hear in Mark 9 what's going on. And Jesus responds, you know, Jesus is long suffering. He says, man, how long am I going to have to wait with you guys who don't believe? So someone doesn't have faith in this picture. And that's why he says, you know, there's this immediate problem of exorcism. I, there's a couple different ways you could read it. Uh, you could read it that the Father doesn't really have faith. Mm. I'm not so sure about that. And then the, the more common one is that the disciples lack faith. Well, I mean, all throughout the Gospels, Jesus is constantly calling out the disciples for their lack of faith. Uh, so I think that's the, the, the stronger, safer exegesis we have here, the passage. Uh, but there still is an issue of, of faith we're going to see with the Father. You know, it's, uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk about faith a little bit more. But the, just note the endurance that this man has to go through. Uh, this man has to wake up every day with the same problem, and God calls his people uh, to do that. Uh, and so for this man to have the endurance to still seek out healing, to still pray uh, for this person, it's astonishing, uh, and it is a witness to faith. I remember being in a church once where uh, someone who had been disabled their whole life, every single Sunday, they asked their congregation to pray that they got better. And it was one of those things that, you know, they had gone through a whole lot. They'd been through it every day. They kept going on in the faith, but they still said, hey, I can pray every day about it if I want to. Uh, God says that I'm allowed to. In fact, he calls us to persevere in prayer. And so do we have that endurance? Do we keep facing the trials that we face every day? Uh, and do we do it in faith? That's a, an important question for us looking at this text. This man uh, has enough faith to keep going and, and keep looking for help for his son. So Jesus is, is astonished, uh, but then again, the, the child is brought before him. He falls on the ground, foaming at the mouth. Uh, and at this point, I mean, I imagine that the father's just about ready to give up. Uh, verse 21, and Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. This is a beautiful passage. Uh, it's, I, I love it uh, in, in Greek. You know, the father, he is he's saying to him, um, I believe, like, like literally help my unbelief. Help me fix this, God. He, he comes and he cries out to Jesus. Jesus says, if you can, you're doubting me. You're doubting my divine power. Uh, and this, this man just, he cries out, you know, God, I do believe, but please help me because I'm slipping. Uh, it's, it's one of those things that almost has the image of, you know, he's holding on to something and it's slipping and he's asking God to help. There's a, a beautiful verse in the Bible uh, that says that a, a bruised reed God will not break and a smoldering wick he will not put out. And that's what this man's faith is, right? It's a, it's a bent piece of grass. It's a smoldering wick that's right about to go out, but he still has faith. Uh, it's so important for us to understand uh, that even the weakest faith is justifying faith. Uh, it, one of the Lutheran dogmaticians like to say, if you want to believe in God, then you do believe. Uh, that, that is the, the beginning of faith is faith. And so this man has the beginning of faith. He has a weak faith. And who can blame him? His life has been incredibly tough. His son has suffered greatly. And yet he goes on in the faith. He passes this test of endurance. Uh, and Jesus tells him this. He says, all things are possible for one who can believe. Or who believes, rather. Sorry. Uh, all things are possible for one who believes. Can you imagine saying that to a father who is, you know, he's at this point of, of desperation with this child all of his life. He's been suffering from this. Uh, and he says, you know, uh, all things are possible. It certainly doesn't feel like all things are possible. In our world, you know, it doesn't feel like all things are possible through God. And yet the scripture tells us that it is. Jesus tells us that it is. So he says, uh, Jesus says this, and, and the, the father responds, I believe, help my unbelief. Verse 24. Verse 25. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. 
and after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, he is dead. Can you believe this? Even after Jesus exercises him, even after he casts out the demon, the boy falls over again. This poor boy has taken so many hits. He falls down a dead. He falls down on the ground like a corpse, and everyone there is saying, yep, Jesus couldn't do it either. He's dead. That's what our world says about the faith, you know? Uh, we pray for, for things, and the world just looks on. Most of the world says, those Christians, they're idiots. It's not true. Uh, there's, there's nothing to their faith. It's just a dead religion. Uh, and it's not true, friends. This boy, he seems as though he's dead. And yet, let's read on to what happens with him. But Jesus, verse 27, took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, That kind, this kind, cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. All right. Very interesting uh, finale to the story. So Jesus reaches down and he picks up. Uh, the kid's hand and he raises him up. This kid that everyone thought was as good as dead. This is a picture of the resurrection. This is a picture of the promise that you have in Jesus Christ, that I have in Jesus Christ. That one day when we do collapse dead, uh, when we do fall over, when we are lying in the dirt as good as dead, Jesus will come and he will lift us up. He will raise our bodies. We will be risen imperishable. We will have no issues anymore. There will be no more demons uh, haunting us or troubling us, demons of health, demons of, of ill will, uh, any type of sin, death, or suffering will be gone at the resurrection. And that's the promise we see here. Jesus is showing it to us. The Messiah, remember we talked about the Messiah? He shows signs of what's going to happen at the last day. It's the first fruits. Remember, it's the first fruits of what we're all going to taste and enjoy on that last day. And so Jesus grabs him by the hand, he picks him up, uh, and the boy is alive again. And then we get to, and so that's the, that's the most important point. So the, the important point is Jesus is supreme. Uh, Jesus is almighty, that his people serve him. The disciples serve him, but the disciples are not perfect. Uh, they don't know everything. Pastors don't know everything. Uh, they don't have the equivalent power to the divine son of God. Uh, I cannot raise the dead. Uh, I cannot heal the sick. Uh, I, I didn't get those those powers or anything like that. I can certainly pray that God would do those things, uh, but I don't have any any special power like that, just like Jesus' disciples uh, didn't. But then Jesus' disciples, and this is where it's kind of a, this is something you can mull over as you, you think about the text this weekend. Uh, Jesus says to the disciples when they ask, well, how why could we cast that one out? Uh, and, and he said to them that this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. And it's a, it's a really interesting passage because he says, uh, so, I, I mean, is this just shock top about, uh, or shop, shock top, uh, shop talk about exorcism, about how you do an exorcism properly? Well, you have to pray, right? Uh, is that the trick? Is that what he's saying in the text? That's certainly what, what some people have interpreted it as. Um, but if you ask the question, well, who prayed in that scenario? You know, who cast out that demon? Uh, I mean, I guess you could say uh, Jesus prayed, but he didn't really pray. He kind of just said something uh, to the demon uh, to be cast out. You could say that that was a prayer. That's that's possible. But there's another thing. Com there's another uh, person praying in the story that uh, commentators have pointed out. And I think they're right about this. Uh, look back in verse 24. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. You know, the, there's an interesting difference here. The disciples are of little faith and the man is of little faith. But which one of them knows that they're of little faith? The man does, not the disciples. They don't acknowledge. They're just trying to, to, to make a power play. Uh, but this man, he knows that he's of little faith. And what does he do in his weakness? He prays. He turns to Jesus and says, Lord, Help thou my unbelief. Uh, so this man prays. So did this man cast out the demon and his son through his prayer? It's, it's certainly, a, a, as far as I know, that's a fair uh, interpretation. 
of that scripture. And so this man passes a test of great endurance. He is still praying for his child after all these years. Uh, you and I might be in situations where we're frustrated or we're upset with something that's happened uh, in our lives or even the lives of our children, like this man. Uh, and are we persevering in prayer? Are we continuing to bring those things to the Lord? Uh, in our sins, are we continuing to go to the Lord Jesus and laying them out for him to forgive us and cleanse us and make us new, uh, truly believing uh, that he will do that? Something for us to meditate on this week. The Lord bless you as you hear his word and rejoice in your Savior Jesus. Goodbye.